Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Flesch, and I'm the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums. And welcome to this third of seven presentations as part of the 2023 Winter Lyceum. Today is the fifth day of March 2023, and I'm broadcasting from Platteville, Wisconsin, home of the world's largest letter M in the heart of the Driftless area, in a special place known as the Upper Mississippi Valley Lead and Zinc Mining Region, where the Badger State was born. Founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville, the museum brings to life a rich cultural heritage rooted in local history, a tradition of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and a celebration of the pioneering spirit, which we recognize to be the living human spirit of ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development. This year's Winter Lyceum continues to be a truly electrifying series of seven presentations. The subjects of the talks range from adaptive reuse of historic mines, to green energy production, to organic farming, to creating artistic geometric abstractions from nature. They all share a theme, and that is the subject of energy in the context of our driftless area landscape and current events. I invite you to stay up to date on museum programs and to support current initiatives online at www.mining.jameson.museum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to enjoy a presentation by program manager Cami Plattner titled Eagle Pitchers NASA Launch Silver Zinc Batteries, the power behind the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab missions. I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate live today, as well as those who may be watching a recording of this event from our library of virtual programs. I extend a warm welcome to current friends of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum's members and donors, and I'd like to thank the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. A&W Restaurant of Platteville, Claire Bank, Edward Jones Financial Advisor Bob Hundhausen, Inspiring Community, Southwest Health, State Farm Agent Jordan Holthouse and Tricor Insurance. And now, before we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session and a survey at the end of this evening's presentation. And because we're a large online group in the interest of time, I invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and just submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen during the talk. And at the end, our speaker will answer as many of the questions as she is able in the order in which they are received. So I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Cami Plattner is a C Senior Program Manager for Eagle Pitcher Technologies, which is an industry-leading producer of batteries, battery management systems, and energetic devices for the defense, aerospace, aviation, maritime, and medical industries. Uh, Plattner joined Eagle Pitcher in 2023 as a Contracts Manager for Aerospace Systems. Um, she has experience working with multiple battery chemistries. Currently, she's driving execution and growth within Eagle Pitcher's silver zinc battery product segment. In this role, she interacts with modern aerospace programs utilizing silver zinc batteries, such as NASA's Space Launch System and ATLAS. She also works on various defense programs, such as Minutemen and Trident missile programs that are key to domestic nuclear triad defense. Uh, throughout the last 19 years, uh, she's worked closely with the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and NASA. Uh, before joining Eagle Pitcher, she was a part of a technical sales team for GSI, GST Steel. Um, she earned her Master's of Business Administration from William Woods University and her Bachelor of Science in Marketing and Management from Missouri Southern State University. Please join me in welcoming Cami Plattner. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. Um, you'll have to bear with me, it's the first time I've given this talk, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I really enjoy the rich history of Eagle Pitcher um, and I appreciate the, the, the introduction. Um, I've actually been with, here with 20 years. Um, uh, I've been here since 20, 2003. Um, just I've worked in various chemistries, but silver zinc has become my forte. So that's gonna be probably the biggest part of what my talk is, of course, the silver zinc batteries are a uh, direct link to our mining history. So that is kind of the main focus, but we'll, we'll be talking about everything else that we, ha we, uh, we have in play here too. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my presentation and bear with me that, you know, the history part, we'll kind of go through a timeline. Um, so it's, it, I, I will break it up here and there uh, with a couple videos um, as we go along. So uh, here we go.
So Eagle Pitcher was founded um, basically 100, over 180 years ago. Um, I'm having issues getting to the next screen here. Give me one second here, it's not working. Okay, <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, so in 1842 is when we were founded, there were by two brothers who had a white lead factory in Cincinnati, Ohio. The, they mostly manufactured pigments for commercial paints. Um, around, so a little bit later, the other side of the company is the P Pitcher lead, lead Company, which began mining in and around the Joplin area uh, in 1874. Only a couple of years later, um, the pitcher lead and zinc company was formed and then by 1881 the company entered zinc smelt, uh, smelting field uh, by 1893 uh, eagle white lead company had become the third largest white lead manufacturer in the united states um, around 1906 um, so the pitcher the pitcher sorry the pitcher lead company of uh, missouri merged with eagle white lead from uh, eagle pitcher lead so uh, Eagle Pitcher, and Pitcher is basically a part of Pitcher, Oklahoma. There was a founder named Pitcher. He actually started mining in Joplin area, but then he founded Pitcher, Oklahoma, and started mining in that area. Um, really, it's part of the whole tri-state mining district, which is southwest Missouri, southeast Kansas, northeast Oklahoma. Um, they did a lot of large-scale mining in the Pitcher area. That was the biggest part of it in 1913. Um, so 80 years after our anniversary um, of forming of Eagle Pitcher, um, it shows that we were producing 85,000 tons of pig lead, which represented one sixth of all the pig lead in the US. So the area became the most productive lead zinc mining field in the district, producing over 20 billion worth of ore between 1917 and 1947. So more than 50% of the lead and zinc metals used during World War I were produced around Pitcher. And the extraction ended by 1967. I had to throw a little tidbit on the side there. Mickey Mantle worked in our mines here in the local area. He's a local boy, and he worked here around the 1949, 1950 era, right before he went off to the Yankees in 51. So, um, um, this is a couple pictures. I'll talk about uh, the railroad company, actually, that we um, accumulated as we grew. The bottom is Pitcher, Oklahoma. It's probably right around the turn of the century. Um, that's the Pitcher. It really is just a mining town, as, as I'm sure you guys are really familiar with here. Um, most of uh, the area did grow out of the mining, but that was probably the biggest one at that time. Um, we also have a little picture there showing some of our uh, white pigment lead um, manufacturing that we did here. A little bit more of the timeline. So then we, you know, we have all this, we're getting really heavy on the lead and zinc, you know, uh, mining. So then we had to do some research and development on what those uses could be for. Um, sorry, I got a little bit, of, got a little bit off there. Um, so that research and development was formed in 1915. By 1922, we were researching into storage battery technologies, 20s and 30s, we were also doing uh, mineral wool, slag wool, we get into a lot of insulation products. We actually do that for quite a while. Um, we actually made insulation products for the Navy as well. Um, well into, I think, the 60s, 70s, 80s, I think we did that. So um, by 1938, we go ahead and we merge with the another tri-state mine operator. So that included basically another railroad company as well. And which you think about that, 1938, uh, $10 billion acquisition, we grew significantly from that acquisition. And at that point, Eagle Pitcher became the largest producer of zinc ore in the nation. By 1939, um, we continue to look for other ways to use the, the, the zinc and the lead. Um, we do a lot of insulation blocks, and then we started to try to get into other ways we could do break into the manufacturing and slowly transition out of the mining or depending on just the mining. And so that's where we started getting into battery oxides, mineral wool, uh, mixed pigment paints and other commercial products. 
in the 40s is when we really started getting involved more and more with the um, the military, just the U.S. Army specifically. Starting off in World War II, uh, we Eagle Pitcher used some diatomaceous earth and zinc to produce storage batteries in the U.S. And by 1944, we had our first purpose, uh, special purpose battery contract to power weather balloons. On the right is a picture that was um, actually posted in a issue, a four, 1947 issue of Fortune magazine showing some of our wool production, uh, wool insulation pro production, I'm sorry, I guess mineral wool slag uh, that we were making back then. Now this is a little bit of a sidebar, but hold on a second here. Um, so I, I was having trouble finding some of the information regarding the actual uh, weather balloons are talking about. But I thought it was interesting um, around that same time that um, we did that, that in the 40s, there were a lot of projects such like this, like it's called Skyhook, that emerged basically um, as a means to sending instruments in the stratosphere and conduct research um, just in, uh, on the atmosphere in general. And then we had some other um, contracts around the same time with ONR, which is something we're really familiar with. So I still think these are all related. Um, where that which led into another project called Stratosphere when they specifically uh, researched the atmosphere and the sun, which was a huge contributor to the emerging space exploration. So you might be able to say in the 40s this was our first first uh, reach into the space exploration and uh, these these types of weather balloons were also uh, mistaken for UFO observations. So I thought that was an interesting uh, sidebar. Um, so I'll kind of start to jump into batteries, and obviously I can answer more questions. There's probably a lot more on mining history we could get into, um, but I was also limited on time in terms of trying to share some of the technologies that we've been involved with and some of the programs we've been involved with um, because of the lead in the zinc. Um, so one of the more prominent batteries we started with for a long time, we had several different kinds, but one of them, of course, was a lead acid battery. And this is just kind of the basics of, of what makes up a lead acid battery. And a actually that same 1947 article from Fortune has a picture of our lead acid manufacturing back from that time frame. And uh, so basically the a lead storage battery that uses lead grids and it has one side it has the um, would be like a lead peroxide the other would be like a pure lead and then it uses a, a disulfuric acid uh, as the electrolyte ingredient to create the reaction that you know that creates the power and stores the energy and a neat, neat thing about a, a storage or a lead acid battery is that you can reverse that um, that activity so it makes it rechargeable. Um, that's just a quick overview on the lead acid. I'm, I'm going to get a little bit more now into the silver zinc side of things, which is what I'm a little bit more familiar with. Uh, that's that's my area. So the thing about a silver zinc battery, there are very high energy density. In other words, they have a high amount of energy stored in, in a given space. Um, so there's rechargeable and non-rechargeable silver zinc batteries, which they're used, and they've been used for decades in the military and aerospace applications where high energy and power density are really required. Eagle Pitcher in, initiated development of automatic and remote activated silver zinc batteries in the early 1950s. Um, the system, those kind of systems were developed as simple single section batteries in which we could, uh, well, in which, which the, the voltage was easily maintained. Um, and again, all of these are really, they're very custom. So by maintaining flexible engineering, the custom design, the development qualification, uh, we're able to meet a lot of special requirements um, that's unique to each mission or program that we're, we're using them for. So this kind of a, shows a summary of kind of how we manufacture it's very high level uh, explanation how we manufacture a silver zinc battery we have so the positive plates are made out of a silver 
oxide, silver plating material that goes through a treatment to, to kind of oxidize that. Um, and then it's separately, we also do a negative material, which is made from the zinc. Um, and it goes from a, some kind of a somewhat similar situation when you put those together uh, that will recreate a cell. And the silver zinc battery, uh, the electrolyte or the salt that uh, makes it active is a uh, potassium hydroxide solution. So the, the big advantages of a silver zinc is that um, they're considered lightweight, um, which I don't know if people aren't familiar with some of these custom batteries, it might be a funny thing because you know a lot of our regular batteries are anywhere from five pounds to 70 pounds. Um, but for the for the uh, for the punch that they they I guess that they they provide the power that they provide uh, they have they're pretty considered lightweight so um, most silver zinc cells weigh just a third to one fifth of a nickel cadmium or lead acid cells but provide comparable energy they're compact um, they're about one half to a fourth the space of other widely used rechargeable cells. Um, they are real powerful and they can be discharged from tremendously high rate rates, which makes them ideal for missile and space launches, which we'll get into. Um, they are really stable. They can provide a stable operating voltage until nearly all the capacity was, is withdrawn. Uh, silver zinc cells have never caused or contributed to any serious accident. They're considered very safe. Um, they're very popular with the Navy because um, some of the comparable um, one of the comparable type batteries that you could use for some of the same applications would be a lithium ion, but lithium ion is really not considered safe in a, especially a water type environment. So the Navy um, has a preference of using a silver zinc for many of those applications. Um, they're also considered very reliable. So we've been, they've been used for dozens of critical applications all the way up from, you know, um, um, manned and unmanned uh, units, um, submersibles, um, like I said, it launches, and like I said, it's been around for, um, well, about 70 years now, so. Silver zinc batteries also are widely used in demanding environments, um, so they're really rugged, um, and that's why they have a lot of, they have a wide range of use in the sp uh, missile and space industries, um, and then some of them, not all of them, are also rechargeable. So uh, silver zinc cells can provide hundreds of charge and, and discharge uh, cycles. Um, they have a lot of selections of sizes. We got a pretty rich history with them. So we have a lot of custom sizes that are available. Um, we also have uh, several, it's pretty customizable in terms of we can make a lot of different cell types. Um, and then packaging is, is um, you can arrange things in, in series and different, and you can make different sections. So it, it gives it a lot of options. And so it's pretty um, adaptable to a lot of different uh, applications. Um, and other than that, we do just, we do, we do a lot of customization. So um, it's easy to customize. Um, next slide. So I'm going to jump into some of the some of the applications that we we have. So kind of jump into the space race. Um, Eagle Pitcher batteries have been trusted for the historical NASA launches, including Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, etc. Um, since the very beginning of the U.S. spacecraft and satellite programs, Eagle Pitcher has supplied batteries for more space missions than any other company. The space race first started with 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 the Soviets um, with the Sputnik so everybody was surprised by that and this led to the US to you know create NASA and expedite uh, all US space exploration efforts and the first launch was Explorer one and we had a battery on it and it was a silver zinc. Um, so that was in 1958. Um, so then after that. A goal of getting crewed spaceflight became the next goal. Um, so we that's when we got into the Mercury missions. So we were on the Mercury missions um, launched by the Atlas rocket. And so we were on 
those missions. Um, the top right shows the different types of missions that the, the, the Mercury went through. And then 1960, we are also in the Discover uh, Reconnaissance Satellites. Um, actually, that's bottom right is one of the first recovered batteries. So it's been a little dissected there, so it's a little torn up. But so that's the first battery that ever came back from space down there. Um, and uh, by then we moved into the next generation of the of the you know uh, launch space launches and those are the project gemini's and that's all the gemini's at the bottom all the missions that it went through and that was launched by a titan which we have a long history with as well so when i talk about mercury gemini etc and then atlas and titan all the launchers so we depending on the application the, the silver zinc batteries were utilized maybe in the module, the crew, mo the crew modules that they're developing, as well as the launchers, depending on the application. So some of these systems will have multiple batteries. So here we jump into the one that's probably the most popular in terms of the space race. There's all the, the Apollo missions back in um, 1960s, 70s. This is the end goal. So the Apollo missions were going to get the people, get men on the moon, and that was in a big race to do so. Of course, everybody, if if you're familiar with Apollo, Apollo One was a, considered a full failure. Basically, when they were just doing a rehearsal, they had an accidental fire and, and it caused uh, some deaths. Um, it's un really unfortunate, but it, that's where um, all of these programs through the years. Um, when we have these, these big problems, and these mistakes, we always learn from them. And that's why it was delayed for about two years to put some more safety measures in place. And then they um, finally launched again on uh, Apollo 7 in 1968. Of course, Apollo 11 is the one where they landed on the moon. So everything went well there. And then the follow-up launch on Apollo 13 was April 1970. And that is the one where when they went to stir the oxygen tanks, they had an explosion, which is that's what that middle picture is that caused damage to the service module. So the crew had to abandon that and it just kind of goes into play what everybody had to do to adapt at that point. Um, and so everybody had to go over to the, the lunar module and then we had to figure out what to do. So I, I really like the quote from Jim Lovell. Um, He's got a book, Lost Moon, that, that speaks about this experience and, and the, everything that they went through on that. But um, I, there are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people who wonder what happened. To be successful, you need to be a person who makes things happen. And that's really a big summary of what happened with the Apollo 13. Um, ultimately, what happened is the they didn't have enough power because they normally, since they were going to be trying to survive in the lunar module, which was only designed to support two men um, for two days. They had to figure out how to stretch that out for four days for three men. So the crew had to experience a lot of extreme environments um, and adapt some of the modules basically to make them, to be able to get them back. So ultimately they had to use an Eagle Pitcher battery, to pull some power. Basically it was an Eagle Pitcher battery that was on the lunar module. They had to pull some re reserve energy from it, some reserve power from it to be able to put it on the command module and bring it back home. So, um, you know, I, we know there was probably some margins in some of the things that they had on the system, but without that battery, they probably wouldn't have got home. Um, they didn't have guarantees for sure. Um, and I just have a little diagram on the right. It's just, I was talking about how we always all learn lessons and that's how a big, big growth in the um, um, in terms of the space applications, all the problems that we've had over the years, you know, Challenger, et cetera, we've always learned from them. And that's where they implemented additional batteries and safety systems going forward. Um, kind of try to talk about some of that later on here. But um, we also, in addition to being on the actual Apollo, the actual lunar roving vehicles that we um, that we actually put on the moon, um, that, that was on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. Those had silver zinc batteries as well. 
I'm going to go a little bit at the same time while all of this is going on, we started to have a significant growth um, on the defense side. So we'll kind of go through some of that as well. Um, in the middle, there's just kind of a ray of some of our silver zinc batteries. And most of these are still pretty common today and are they're ones that were designed way back in 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, but I'll kind of go through some of that here. So the biggest growth of those silver zinc battery business was probably in the 50s through the 70s. Um, one of the first ones we have is a Hawk. And this is a Hawk missile system at the top right. Um, it's actually short for homing all the way killer. Um, it was developed around 1952. Um, it's really easy to change and upgrade. It was first put, per, actually first put into service around the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and then it was used in the Vietnam War, Iran, Iraq Wars, Gulf Wars, and it's actually and going to be probably utilized during in the Ukraine War. Uh, of course, the US doesn't really use it that much, but all of the NATO allies use this quite a bit still, such as Spain, uh, Singapore, Sweden, Greece, um, etc. Um, we also have the harpoon, which is there on the bottom left. Now it was started by the US Navy in 1965 because we realized it, we didn't have a lot of um, options for any engagements with submarines, which was um, there was a big growth of that in that time frame. Uh, first harpoon was delivered around 1977 and by 2004 there uh, 7000 of them had been delivered. Um, I actually have a short video, I believe. I can get to it. Um, oh, there we go. Get my screens all messed up here. Regarding the harpoon, hope it works here. We're gonna back it up. At twelve feet seven point. Anti-ship missile developed and manufactured by McDonnell Douglas, now on defense, space and security. A harpoon was originally developed for the U.S. Navy, but in 1983 was adapted for use on B-52H bombers. has lagged 15 feet 2 inches for ship launch and 12 feet 7.5 inches for air launch. Its diameter is 13.5 inches, 1,160 pounds weights, 537 mile per hour maximum speed with 67 nautical miles in range. Sustained cruise trajectory with active radar guidance. The harpoon is capable of executing both land strike and anti ship missions. To strike targets on land and ships in port, the missile uses GPS aided inertial navigation to hit a designated target endpoint. <laughs> There's more to it, but uh, I don't want to burn too much time going through because uh, there's a lot more to show you guys, uh, talk to you guys about. Um, uh, there's other missiles and tor torpedoes were also very popular um, at that time frame in terms of development. We have an AIM-7 Sparrow. Uh, it was developed in the late 50s, and it's a lot like the Hawk in terms of it was replaced with more modern technology, but AIM-7 Sparrows used by our allies a lot. Same way with uh, Nike Hercules was one of them as well. Um, it's another missile that was developed around that same time frame. 
and then it was replaced by the Patriot, which I think some people are a little bit more familiar with. The original Patriot had a silver zinc battery on it, and it's still in use today. It's just a little bit more modern technology, um, and it uses a different battery now um, that uh, is a different electrochemistry that Eagle Pitcher also makes, which I'll probably introduce you guys to some of those as well. Um, then we get into the ICBM. So intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles, such as the Minuteman, is also a pretty big growth area around the 60s. Um, it was, um, uh, I do have a short clip if I can make it work, but we'll, we'll go through this first. Um, it's important to show the clip in, in some ways because when you see the Minuteman missile, you'll understand it goes through several phases once it reaches altitude. Um, it, and each of those phases um, basically have a different uh, application in terms of the battery that is needed for those phases. So each of the Minutemans has several batteries on there. So they have basically a battery that powers the rocket motor. There's a battery that powers the arming and the fusing um, basically for the reentry vehicle, vehicle depending on which type of uh, reentry vehicle they're using. Um, there's a premature separation stage battery, a telemetry battery, a command destruct battery, there's a missile guidance battery. Um, all of these um, are key um, importance to the, the, the system and a lot of them are actually a lot of safety backup systems as well in case there's anything that goes wrong. Um, there's a rough schematic of one of those type batteries that's on that system. Um, the current version of the of the Minuteman actually has been in existence since the 70s, and it, that same version is still in use today. Um, I think the Air Force now is trying to work on the next generation designs, which will be referred to this, as the Sentinel. Uh, many of those systems and the type of power that they use on the new version is going is kind of TBD. Um, I think we're doing kind of decent on time. See if I can go back to this other. Get off the rear go. Just going to show you about a one minute um, clip of this. Um, or that. It just shows all the different phases it goes through. So a battery is used for each of these phases every time it does something once it reaches the atmosphere. That's really that on that one. Um, uh, on to the next one. We're also um, currently on the Trident, so it's basically the sea-based version of the um, of the nuclear triad. So uh, this is kind of has a similar history with the um, Minuteman. It's a submarine-based um, ballistic missile, and it's equipped with targetable reentry vehicles. It was originally developed by Lockheed Martin and it's armed with a war, nuclear thermonuclear warheads launched for from nuclear powered ballistic missiles. Um, 
So the Trident missiles are, uh, they're carried by the United States Navy Ohio class submarines. Um, and then also the British Royal Navy, uh, them on the Vanguard class submarines as well. It first began, the Trident program first began in 1955 with the Polaris and the EPT Silver Zinc primary electronic battery has been on every flight since that time. Um, so it, I went, do you want to point out, so, you know, I'm showing these, these big, scary nuclear weapons, but it, we've never actually ever used them. We do test launches all the time just to, to share the success of those so that people aren't tempted otherwise. So um, really just the test launches and the success of those programs themselves um, are kind of a, a, just a natural deterrent um, to keep from <laughs> any other threats. Um, I do have a little summary, kind of an exploded uh, view of what the primary battery I was talking about. This is the one, one of those batteries, it's about 70 pounds. Um, exploded view, basically this is the cell makeup. So that's all the cells are in the battery. Uh, it has a coil system that delivers the electrolyte to it. Um, and that's how that's activated and, and used, so. Um, the current version of the Trident missiles refer to the D5. It's, this, it's, that's the version that's been the use probably since the 80s. Um, and now the Navy is actually going through and trying to do a modernization of the missile as well. And that is supposed to be fielded somewhere in the 2036 or so time frame. Kind of go back to some of the space related items in terms of these are some of the modern ones we're still working on so the atlas launcher is still in, in use it's been a pretty adaptable uh, launcher over the years it was first developed in 1957 as we kind of mentioned it earlier on some of those early space missions it's gone through a lot of design updates um, and the current version is the fifth version it's the atlas five um, and it's operated with ULA, which is basically a joint venture of Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Um, right now, Atlas V, or actually just the Atlas, I guess, is, is considered America's longest serving active rocket. Um, back in 2021, um, ULA actually announced that they're gonna retire the Atlas, um, but it still had about 30 launches planned that have already been sold. Um, Still has about 19, 18 or 19 of those left. I think 18 left. Um, it kind of, the time frame that it's had, it's made it the most versatile launcher we've ever had to date. Um, EPT has several types of batteries on these systems, each serving different purposes from the main backup power, telemetry power, guidance and navigations power, um, et cetera. Most recently, uh, Atlas has been a little bit in the news because Amazon um, picked the Atlas to launch its Project Cooper, which will have basically, um, I think it's going to launch some satellites for internet um, constellation services. So, And then the latest one we have actually um, Artemis. And so. The space launch system is part is basically the launcher for the Artemis uh, program. Artemis is NASA's uh, attempt to get back into the manned space flight and get us back to the moon and Mars. Um, um, it's also going to integrate um, the Orion. So the Orion is where the crew module is going to be in place. And that's the Orion is the one that is eventually going to be the module that lands on Mars. So this has been a pretty exciting um, few years. This actual the SLS, we have a, what we call it, it's called an FBU. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> the FBU is a flight termination battery on the rocket. So it's basically a safety system, it helps disable everything in a safe manner. Um, in case there is an issue. Um, that battery, just to give you a perspective on NASA programs specifically, this is not unusual. That battery was in a development and qualification. Um, we actually just hit our ninth year. We are delivering all of the, uh, the batteries have been used on the, the, the launch that just happened um, in November and uh, all the launches that are planned thereafter. We've been delivering those, but we've been in that 
program for nine years. So it took us seven and a half to get it developed and qualified. So that's pretty typical of a NASA program. I, I, uh, it's kind of bittersweet. I actually got to go when they were supposed to initially launch this in August and that's when it got scrubbed. So um, I, I was hoping to get to see that in person, but I didn't get to do that. But if you guys have Twitter, we do have a lot of videos on there of that launch. It was pretty exciting. Um, it's a very large launcher. It's one of the biggest ones um, we've ever made. Um, I say we, NASA, I shouldn't say we. Um, so, but we were really happy to be a part of that. There's actually, for future missions, we actually have more uh, batteries in development, but it, it's adding additional safety features to the SLS. Um, so that the, the not only do, is it dependent on the crew disabling anything, but it also allows for anything to be automatically disabled. Um, so they're definitely big on all the safety systems. Um, That's what a lot of our batteries are supporting. Um, I thought this was a kind of a nice uh, summary of, of all the different launchers uh, over the years. Of course, uh, we've had we've had a lot of involvement in Saturn. Uh, we've been on space shuttles, all the space shuttle missions, all the Atlas. Have not had a lot of involvement on Ariane 5 or the Falcon 9, all the Falcon heavies. Um, believe it or not, some of these Falcons actually are using marine type batteries, um, which is, is baffling to us. <laughs> but uh, we're on the SLS, and I know that the Starship is the next one that's in development right now. Um, so Eagle Fisher has, well, we're almost pushing 70 years of Silver Zinc battery production heritage, and that's, and Silver Zinc alone, we have over 200 battery designs. Um, we continue to produce those reliable complex systems for missiles, aerospace, and maritime industries. Um, we'll touch on a little bit, a little bit on that later, but uh, we do have underwater vehicles unmanned underwater vehicles is another um, use for silver zinc batteries. Um, the systems, um, you know, they're, they're pretty simple. I think the industry in some ways may be leaving silver zinc behind because silver zinc, the one thing that a lot of people like about it is it's, it's, it's very hardy, it's very reliable, it hardly ever fails. And because that nobody wants to change anything when you don't change anything you kind of get left behind on some of the technology so the way we at eagle pitcher build a silver zinc battery today is very much like we would had built it 50 60 years ago um it's a pretty archaic process um kind of going into a summary of everything else that we do um that we've kind of growth in terms of you know i could talk about Silver Zinc um, and the whole space race and the launchers and the and the, the whole defense industry growth that we had 50s, 60s and 70s um, helped fund all the new technologies in terms of uh, we have thermal batteries you know, got into lithium ion, etc. I'll kind of go into some of those, but many of these other notable programs that we have for other chemistries, uh, such as a nickel hydrogen, which is what this Hubble Space Telescope is. Um, that's a bottom right battery right there. It was the help from the Hubble Space Telescope. We also have lithium ion and thermal. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope, one of the things we got to, you know, another claim to fame there is that um, it was launched around 1990 and um, the batteries were replaced finally by 2009. They were only supposed to last about five years and they, they were still working in 2009. So it was only supposed to uh, go for five years and it went 19. Um, we also have a battery that powered the space station that we use as a coffee table at one of our facilities. Um, Cause so these, so these battery systems are quite large. Um, we also have, so this is a, the top, that green looking strange one is a battery for the Orion manned crew um, system. Um, and then we have, I think this is probably one of the Mars, um, Mars rover batteries that's in the middle there. Um, so we are on a lot of the Mars rovers, such as Curiosity, Spirit, Opportunity. Um, um, and then this is kind of just on our, even our website, we have a rolling clock showing that we, how many hours in space that we have without a single failure. So we're over 3 billion at this point.
Um, so I guess I wanted to break out, you know, we actually have a lot of diversity in terms of our chemistries and applications. Um, so we have at least six electrochemistries um, and the different markets that they can cover. Um, of course, we actually have 30 that we dabble in. It's just these are the six main ones that we we, we deal with. Um, so we have a lot of different solutions for any given market, depending on the requirements that may be available. We actually have, even on our medical side, we have a small implantable batteries. I think there for a while, I don't know if we still do, we, we were claiming that we had the world's smallest battery. Um, there's kind of an overview of all of our customers and partners. Um, we have a lot of relationships with all the top defense prime contractors um, and space contractors as well, and then all of the U.S. government branches, um, especially uh, I know for me, partial to the Navy, the Navy is one of my biggest customers in terms of silver zinc use. Um, and like I said before, I work with ULA and Boeing, things like that on the space side as well. Um, this is a nice, I, you know, I really focused on silver zinc and then some of the mining history, but this is really a big overview of everything that we've been involved in. So you can also notice that we were on the space space shuttle launches um, in the 80s and 90s, and we were even involved on, um, we got involved on the B2 medical batteries starting around the 2000 timeframe. And then we're also getting involved into high energy weapons such as lasers for the Apache and uh, just Navy magazine lasers, etc. So pretty exciting and long history. Again, this kind of overview of all of the uh, different types of chemistries and their uses, their applications. Uh, unmanned underwater vehicles is a kind of a growing thing, just like unmanned um, you know, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, things like that. Uh, those, are, those are growing uh, in terms of usage. Um, kind of exciting in terms of the with the launch of the SLS and even the Falcon and things like that. So the satellites and, and things like that opportunities are picking up as well. So and uh, just as a company, you know, I think this, this slide's a teeny bit outdated. We're about 180 years now. So um, we have 60 plus years on space missions. Um, we've kind of surpassed that at this point. We have over 160 engineers. Um, and it's just kind of shows the rich history that we have. This is all our facilities that we have um, across the US. Most of us are, of course, are centrally lo located here near Joplin. Um, again, where the all the mines start. It's actually this facility um, where I'm at. I'm actually located at the Joplin, uh, Missouri facility. And uh, it looks good from here, but we'll literally there are still some remnants of the mining days here. Um, I actually joke about when people come to visit to my facility, <clears throat> there's almost a century for every floor. Some bottom floors where we do a lot of the manufacturing or formation is what we call it for the silver zinc batteries. And that's on the main floor and it's from the 1800s. Um, over years and years, we've had to cover up where all the rail cars used to be going through the property. Um, you, it wasn't that long ago, you could see them. So some of those are all covered up. Some of the buildings are kind of remnants of that. Um, and then, like I said, there's three floors to our building and there's one for every century, pretty much. The top floor was built in 1994, so it's close, but yeah, you know, so I still say the same thing, but, um, and then all the other facilities are much newer. Um, of course, our energetics is a little bit unique. Um, they literally do a lot of, um, um, energetic devices, so it's a lot of explosive devices, so that's why they're a little bit different in terms of they're pretty spread out uh, with bunkers and things like that, so it's a little different. Again, that's just kind of showing a simple array of, you know, sample of, of some of the types of batteries we do. Everything we do is custom, so everything looks a little bit different based on the application what they and what sizes they need. <clears throat> I like this slide because it really shows a lot of the things that we're doing and that we're involved in back way back all the way to now uh, uses a huge combination of things de dependent on the application. So, for example, on the, um, the perseverance, 
um, that was launched in 2020. It had a bunch of silver zinc batteries on the actual Atlas launcher that launched the, the, the Perseverance. And then it has some batteries um, that help with the reentry vehicle system. And then it has lithium ions actually powering the rover. So it's a good example of uh, a lot of the systems like that use different chemistries for different applications. And then I just have a, a just a quick video I'm going to show and I can open it up for questions. Um, this is just a much better overview of where we are today um, than I can speak so. Sorry about that. Hoping it'll get back on track here. Silver zinc is its strong suit right here.
can get into glitches. Getting into glitches. I'm sorry, guys. I'm about to stop here. I'm going to go ahead and pause it because it's not getting any better. But I guess you get the gist of it. Um, it's showing some of our newer stuff. Of course, I'm a little jealous. Uh, some of this newer stuff has a lot of automation on it. But uh, that really does cover everything I had to, to speak about today. We're ready to open it up for any questions. Well, thank you, Cami, so much. That's uh, fabulous. So interesting. It, it's um, really hard to cram everything into a, an hour, but I uh, tried. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Great job cramming so much into an hour. Holy cow. Did you ever hear the expression that uh, something is like not rocket science? But um, yeah, I know exactly. I was like, well, much everything it's funny. Been you about I is, actually work with rocket scientists around here. <laughs> yeah, literally, it's all about rocket science. So, so that's very interesting. Yeah, it is. It's kind of a change of pace uh, for for our museum, our museum audience. Uh, where you know we aren't often talking about high tech industries like this. We're usually focusing on local history or our mining history and heritage. Um, right. But I think this kind of goes to show some of the things that you're talking about have to do with strategic technology. And could you please um, just uh, answer one quick question, and that is, what is a strategic mineral? Well, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. So really minerals, um, well, there's all, all kinds of minerals have different usage in terms of the, the um, um, it, <laughs> I think we're still discovering some of those. So, you know, we were talking about that earlier. Um, have we found everything here on Earth? And you know, what's what's the thing in terms of? And you have to look at how much is of it is available in terms of long term use. Um, you know, lithium ion is the big buzz right now, and it's something that's still you know, a lot of mined um, uh, components to lithium ion. So you have to look at that as a whole. Um, you have to take everything into account. Um, we were talking earlier, I know that, you know, we, we, we talk amongst ourselves, you know, we wonder what's next in terms of all this exploration to the, to Mars and to the moon, you know, how it's, I think it's just a matter of time we start mining those for our next strategic minerals that we look at um, in terms of the future. Um, so we're kind of come full circle here before too long, I think. Fabulous. And then we're thinking about questions of place, you know, the relationship between place and technologies. It seems like uh, there have been changes in Eagle Pitcher. Started off as a mining company and got into the technology side. You know, even, even our uh, area here, Platteville, uh, used to be a mining college and a teacher training college. Now it's really kind of focused on uh, training engineers, high tech uh, engineering. And so um, I'm kind of wondering, like, which comes first, you know, the mineral or the or the te technology? And when uh, uh, Eagle Pitcher is thinking through uh, what the next technology is going to be, I guess uh, maybe at first it was a mining company, so you were looking for a market for the kinds of minerals that you had right. at hand. Is that right? But then, uh, but now maybe it's not like that anyway anymore. So what came comes right now? I, I, yeah, that's a no, that's a good question. So yeah, it, there's a lot of um, concepts that are always being thought up, and what are the best materials? We're constantly searching for new materials, um, and the combination of types of materials to make those concepts a reality. Um, uh, I would, I'm probably not even aware of what the latest is, but it's a, con it definitely is a revolving situation. Um, you know, we actually have a kind of a mining college not too far away there in Rolla. Um, so I know that's part of what they do too. We actually have a lot of um, interaction with them in terms of a lot of our, our talent comes from that area. Um, so it, it's, it's still a lot of that knowledge is very key to what we do in terms of next steps technology. 
um, it all comes from a lot of the the mining colleges in terms of the history of it and the applications that those minerals can have in terms of um, energy options. A lot of chemistry, um, that's that's a big part of it too, so. That makes sense. So, okay, we we started with uh, lead and lead acid batteries. Okay, and then we talked a little bit about uh, zinc and the zinc silver batteries. And so Orland Edge had a great question, which is where did the silver come from that was mined for use in those batteries? Um, we do have some local silver mines initially. Yeah, it wasn't as prevalent, but we did have some. Um, of course, we've had to outsource most of that um, for quite a while, um, but we do have some history, just wasn't as prevalent as the lead and the zinc. Um, um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure all of the sources right now, but silver is very hard to come by right now. Um, so it is very much a diminishing supply. So it is a, a growing concern um, how much longer that's going to be available um, because sources are limited. I know just in general, uh, we've had supply chain issues since since the pandemic. We're still talking about it. Um, that really um, has tried to people have been trying to ramp up production, but and getting that sourced has been pretty difficult in terms of any silver. So it's a diminishing resource that has to be looked at, but I don't know where else we got it to be specific. Um, it was such a small part compared to the the lead and the zinc that we were we were extruding and, and using utilizing at the time. Uh, we did do some of it locally, though. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, you know, this is the Upper Mississippi Valley Mining District where we are, and they. Uh, still call those ore deposit types that were named for this region NVTs. And I think you and our MVTs are unlike ones in other parts of the world didn't have silver here. But I think over there in Missouri, you had some silver, which was kind of nice. Yes. So that was good for the economics. OK, and yeah. now um, we here's a question for you from uh, Hap and Barb Dawes. Um, uh, the previous two Lyceum, uh, we were talking about uh, one adaptive reuse of underground mines locally as possibly a place where we could theoretically um, either generate power or store power. And then uh, last week we were uh, talking about some uh, green power generation, either through a uh, solar uh, and wind. And then we have this problem of storage. And so uh, happened, Barb wonder uh, is Eagle Pitcher Technologies uh, uh, working on battery storage for either um, wind or solar we we've dabbled in it at some points i mean it's a little bit more on the commercial side of things and so we when we get involved in it, it's more been for the military purposes but we have dabbled in solar um energy it is the the biggest trick on the solar energy and the this and and wind energy is storing that energy and and utilizing it in an efficient manner so that you can use it during your peaks and valleys in terms of uh, energy. Um, it's, it's a very difficult market because it's so competitive right now. Um, until we, Eagle Picture, feel like we get a, a better technology for that and we're not fighting for the lithium ion side of things because that's the big, that's the key driver in terms of energy storage with that. Um, you can do other chemistries, but it's usually a lithium type. Um, we, we're not really dabbling in it too much. Uh, we have done it and it wasn't wasn't something that was a growth area for us. Um, we are more into the small custom type scenarios and applications that we use. But uh, um, I, I still think that there's probably options out there where that that could change. Um, I don't think it's still the most efficient thing. Solar and and wind energy are definitely good com concepts. I think it's really good for a hybrid system to use that. Um, but I do believe that we have a lot long ways to go to make those more efficient. Um, there's a couple of other commercial types of uh, battery applications that uh, some of our viewers are asking about. Uh, Hap and Barb ask about, say, the kinds of radios used with uh, amateur uh, radios or other handheld radios. Is that something Eagle Pitcher deals in? Um, we actually, so the we actually do like certain kind of this little bitty batteries. It's actually a lithium type battery for the soldier power is what we call it for. But the little handheld radios are very, very vital business 
actually for us, um, making sure that it maintains um, the power that the, the soldier needs while they're out in the field and they don't have a way to recharging. They don't want to have to carry a lot. So the weight is very important at the same time. Uh, yeah, we do dabble in that, at least on the uh, at least in the military side of things, which does translate into commercial. Um, we don't make a lot of those cells very individually. We are we do work on that in terms of developing different, better cells for that. Um, <clears throat> right now, we just package them, but we are working on developing the smaller, lighter, longer lasting batteries and that, those kind of capacities. Um, but you, I mean, you think about even like the original transistor radio type situation, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had been involved in that. If you think about the basic technology of that would be similar to a battery in terms of the basics of, of um, and you know, they used a lot of copper. We use, sometimes we, we use a, we talk about it being a silver zinc battery, but sometimes we use the collector is actually a copper. So it's kind of similar in terms of uh, some of the materials you would use. The collector would be a copper, and we put we put silver material in the um, the grid is what we call it. Um, but some of those um, collectors are actually copper is very common, so it's kind of similar in terms of what you need for a transistor radio. You use copper wiring to do that. So it's got, it's got a lot of history there too. I see. And how about? Uh vehicle batteries such as car batteries Orlin Edge uh, is wondering about. Yeah, so since it's such high volume, um, we, we actually don't, we have done what we, you know, we even dabbled in similar type things like that. So we had done what we called a horizon battery system for a while. And that was a collection of batteries and it usually is a lithium type, but that still is the best application at, at this time in terms of the, where the technology is. Uh, we were actually, they were used for um, big equipment such as forklifts, things like that we had put in, we had uh, developed. Um, we didn't stay in that very long. Again, um, commercial side of things, it's very, very competitive. Um, and you have to have a lot of volume, a lot more resources than we do. We do a lot of things on a lot smaller volume. So um, we have experience with that. We, we do a lot of R&D in it still. Um, we just don't do that on a regular basis in terms of our market share. Got it. Uh, Dina has some great questions. Uh, she shares that uh, she uh, considers herself an Air Force brat and uh, thinks that the silver zinc battery storage history as it relates to the air and space program is, is quite fascinating and, and, and shares yeah. a big thank you. Um, one of her questions is, um, According to the Eagle Pitcher website, deep cycle batteries are typically used for solar storage with about 500 cycles of battery storage life. Could you expand on Eagle Pitcher's investment uh, or involvement in solar storage? Right. So, you know, that is definitely that's definitely on the lithium side of things. And I would say that we started researching and developing that kind of technology late 90s, early 2000s and really it's a big part of what our what we call it's called our crossroads facility. It's one of our newest facilities. Uh, we actually got the government to help fund us um, some of the equipment so we could advance that technology. Um, that is the key: is how many how many cycles you can safely safely run those batteries through in terms of keeping that storage, storing the the, the energy and then using it and recycling it back and forth is 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 key on making it most efficient. So yeah, that is. That's, I mentioned that earlier, we're constantly researching that and trying to improve upon that. A big thing on a lithium is you wanna make sure you have to have, basically it's what we call a battery management system. It, re, it manages that, oh, there's an electronics that go into that, that manage um, the cycles on that so that it keeps it safe. Um, Cause that's always a risk with lithium ion. The higher you get, the higher power you get, the higher cycles you get. Um, there's there's the fire risk, so that's the biggest thing that we fight, and we we feel like we've done really well with that. So that's what we um, have spent a lot of time researching and, and developing is the safety side of it. Now here's a question about propulsion from Dina. She she says propulsion looks like it may have some application for recharging systems, or uh, and or battery backup storage system projects. 
And is Eagle Pitcher involved in any research on propulsive devices and recharging electrical systems or for generating backup energy storage? Yeah, um, we do that. That's that's still mostly on the lithium ion and silver zinc side of things. Um, uh, in terms of rechargeable, lithium ion is still the biggest contender for that. Um, you have some people that are getting more into a nickel type um, chemistry. Uh, they're looking at those kind of technologies as well for those kind of applications. Uh, we definitely are a big part of the propulsion. Um, really, it's just more the you know, silver zinc is going to provide the main power for the electronics that control it more than anything. Um, because you're still depending on the motors and type of fuel. And then we also have energetics that are involved in terms of the actual propulsion itself. We, where our batteries are mostly doing is, is um, controlling the electronics, tracking that more than anything. Um, yeah, the, the lithium ion is has the biggest coverage of most of what you're talking about. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're constantly doing a lot of research and development on what else is available, um, because you can imagine everybody wants to use lithium ion for everything. It's not going to be available forever. Um, so uh, we that's one of the reasons I think we still keep the silver zinc as it's kind of considered the older chemistry old school chemistry we keep it around um it is you know some of the materials we still have you know our time keeping it but we want to keep it alive in terms of it's a good option for really all of those things um and believe it or not even some of the you know storage systems some of the basic storage uh, backup power things like that even lead acids are still not a bad option i know people are worried about the environment, you know, toxicity and stuff like that, but really everything all the way up to lithium ion has some level of that. So it's just a matter of trying to understand what you can do to recycle things like that. Um, the, those are the some of the technologies I think that are important in terms of moving forward is how you recycle everything. You know, lithium ions got got its issues in terms of trying to figure out the best way to recycle um, those components after a battery is dead. Um, we do the same thing with the silver zinc um, and lead acids should be consideration as well. So, Is uh, silver zinc less environmentally impactful than uh, lithium ion batteries? Um, I, I feel like silver zinc would be a short term impact and smaller volume impact than a lithium ion has a long, I feel like has a longer term effect. Um, there's not a lot of options right now to safely recycle a lithium ion and in silver zinc such an old technology that we are able to do so really the biggest part of it is the, the potassium hydroxide that comes out of it um, so um, we, finding ways to um, dispose of that or recycle that is really the only challenge in lithium ion it's a little bit more complicated and for silver zinc batteries um how is the, is, the, is the metal reclaimed or recycled or how could it be? Yeah, it's, it is a common practice we do, especially, you know, silver is, is, um, it's, it's valuable. It can, we can reuse silver. It can be broken back down into powders and grid and things like that. So we definitely do that. Um, the zinc is in terms of the value of turn, you know, turning that back around isn't as much, but we do definitely do the silver uh, quite often on an expended battery. So it's interesting, uh, you use the word uh, archaic, um, Dina observes about uh, silver zinc. Um, on the one hand, it hasn't changed much in a long time, but you're mentioning that it has certain um, benefits. So what what would you say makes it archaic? And then, uh, and could you compare that just to some other kinds of technologies that well, you know, I kind of do it archaic compared to like, you know, some of the automation when my video started glitching out uh, automation you saw was really relative to lithium ion and our thermal manufacturing. Um, we have the automation that helps everything. We still do everything extremely by hand um, here. And like I said, downstairs in this building, 
um, like we did the exact same way the 60s and 70s really the biggest thing we've been doing is trying to document how we do things and how we build things because it's so manual um, we don't have anything remotely automated we barely have we, ba we barely have thermostats on like our ovens and things like that i mean we're we're way we're way back there um, but in the same time uh, the frustration we have you know, for example, I will use the Navy as an example. They like the the batteries that they get, and they like them so much they don't want us to change anything. So we've been kind of stuck in that mode in terms of you know there is other technologies that are outpacing us by far. Even though this we're holding true and strong, it works. It's reliable. Um, we're trying to look at ways of. Um, of improving the manufacturability of them um, and resources in terms of our supply chain resources, like I've talked about, even as silver. Uh, we have so many components that are hard to get now that we, we, we call it obsolescence. We have it all the time because it's such an old technology. Um, but right now we still have requirements for these batteries. For example, the Trident is supposed to be fielded all the way through 2084. They have launches planned all the way through 2084. So it has a lot of relevancy. So we're constantly fighting that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very much in this terms of the battery world and battery chemistry. Silver zinc is very archaic compared to everything else. But tried and true. And zinc is uh, yep, it's compared tried to and true. Still, still works. Compared to some other uh, minerals, zinc is more more plentiful, is it not, than some of these other rare earth elements or some other metals? That yeah, are and so it yeah, and so um, we it's not like a solid. We use it in like a grid type material, so like your screen, you know, like your your door screen, things like that, is kind of how we get it. We also use zinc powders, zinc oxide powders, so mm -hmm. that's the form that we usually use it in. Interesting. Julie and Mike Tashner wonder how often uh, is Eagle Pitcher's research and development technology sold, marketed, or developed for the commercial industry? Um, you know, there it is. It's not their own, kind of their own community. You know, the the mad scientist of the of the group, uh, <laughs> the the R and D side. They are kind of their own community, and they get involved a lot with universities um in terms of the next best technologies working with um, projects um all the way up from you know something that might be a you know few months few months project to several years project um i'm i know that that overlaps because like a lot of their work really overlaps with university and university work obviously is going to overlap into the commercial world um, commercial world is where you ultimately um can be profitable, I guess, in terms of uh, that's just hasn't been our market forte. Um, we're mostly working with the government. Um, but in terms of commercial, um, we do do that because we like I said, we've got a lot of uh, work in the medical side of things as well. And we know if we at least we at least have to keep up with the technology on a commercial side. So our R&D guys have to be involved with that in order to not get left behind on all of the opportunities out there because we have, you know, you have big, huge companies. Um, I don't, I think a lot of people have probably heard of SAFT. It's a huge battery company. Um, so people like that, that companies like that can leave us behind. Um, so they're, they're, they're definitely involved in that. Um, actually, I, those guys, I don't really get to talk to very much because I am in the old school chemistry, but we, every year we do what we do, a battery class and battery, um, I don't know what we call it, so innovation like workshop. So we get to go through and set what all those guys have been working on. So um, it's some of that does overlap and they do have to interact, but mostly it's at a university uh, level. Um, so though they overlap that way sometimes. I see. Um, now, Ben has got an interesting question about silver. He asks if the decline of 35 millimeter film ha may have had an effect on silver availability. He read back in the 90s that about half of silver produced at that time was recycled from the development of silver used on 35 millimeter film. That's interesting. I guess I didn't really think about that one. I know a lot of silver 
in terms of silver stores in general was held by the government and the government has almost run out. So um, that is interesting you say that. I don't know that I've ever made that correlation or even really thought about that. So maybe something I have to have some people look at. <laughs> uh, we definitely are looking for uh, availability of it for sure. Interesting. Um, now, just to kind of bring it back to Southwestern Wisconsin here, um, are, are you aware if Eagle Pitcher still has any connections left to this part of the world? You know, it's a, I, I, did, I wish I had taken the time to do that and look ahead in terms of, you know, we still have to source a lot of these raw materials such as silver and zinc. Um, and there's a lot of other things too that we probably would come into play. Um, and I have not researched where they actually originate in a while, because, you know, usually those go through a middleman by the time they get to a refiner, et cetera. Um, I'm sure we have overlapped over the time because we, we've I did do find some research where we did source, even though we were heavily into the lead and zinc mining, we did source those from other places. Um, and I know they we had some up in Ohio um, at one point. Um, and so I'm sure we did even probably source some of our materials from your area at one point because we we consumed quite a bit. Absolutely. Well, Eagle Eagle Pitcher's name is is thrown around a lot here at the museum because, of course, uh, uh, Eagle Pitcher uh, ran the, the large Schulzberg operation, the last uh, active uh, lead zinc uh, operation until 1979. So something our region continues to take. Uh, pride in. I was just doing a little reading on it. The ore mined there was composed of barite, galena, and pyrite, waste material yep. consisting primarily of calcite. Um, it, it, it looks like uh, not only zinc is on the current year's uh, United States list of strategic minerals, but also barite is on there. Is barite used in any uh, battery uh, application that you're aware of? Not that I am aware of, but I, you know, I'm... I'm not aware of it, but I'm not saying that's not <laughs> there. Like I said, there's so many in uh, chemistries that we've covered over the years. I'm not sure that it's I, I would be surprised if it's not. Um, but yeah, I I I not surprised that our we've overlapped. I mean, no, we stopped mining here in the 60s. Um, so I'm I'm sure we definitely had to source places like you guys during that time period and after then after that time period for sure. Well, we sure appreciate uh, your sharing some time and your uh, wisdom with us today. I really enjoyed it. I think our uh, audience really enjoyed it as well. Rob, do you have any uh, deep closing thoughts for us, Cami? You know, I you know I wasn't even sure where to start. I I love the history of stuff like that, and I definitely got to refresh myself on some of these things. And um, it actually already has me stirring up thinking other questions. So I appreciate your guys' time and and throwing together this together. Well, thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you, and uh, I hope we'll keep in touch. And I I might have to uh, reach out again to see if you might have any ideas for uh, um, any potential historic artifacts uh, that are uh, zinc related that. Okay. Uh, that, that we might partner on. Uh, anyway, everyone, I'd like to invite you to join us uh, again next uh, Sunday, same time, 5 p.m., uh, March 12th, for Winter Lyceum 4 of 7, and when uh, engineer Mark Nussbaum, uh, shifting gears a little bit, is going to present greening from the ground up, the integration of ground source heat pumps into historic buildings. So just another angle on place-based energy. So thank you so much to all for participating in this uh, program of the Mining and Rollo Jamison Museums, and good night. All right. Thanks, everybody.